Good morning. Once again, good to have each of you here. I'd like you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to the book of Mark, chapter number 9. Mark, chapter number 9. I'm going to read two verses to start off here, if you'll stand with me as we just begin by reading the Word of God, just a couple of verses. In verse number 23 of Mark chapter number 9, we read, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Our Father and our God, we are thankful to you this morning for this opportunity you've given us, you've granted us the gift of life, the strength and the health, and the opportunity to be able to gather here in your presence. Father, I pray that we wouldn't take that lightly, but we truly understand the, that you are here with us, you walking among us, watching over the things that are taking place. We pray, pray that by your Spirit you might instruct us in our hearts, that our hearts would be softened, and Lord, that your Spirit might uh, do a work to take the Word of God and to apply it to us individually. We wouldn't sit uh, and listen to your Word and how it may apply to others, but that we would individually consider for ourselves the truth of the things we will look at this morning. I pray that you might just speak into our hearts in a way that brings honor and glory to the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we confess to the truth of what you've revealed in your Word. Father, we pray that you would receive all the honor and the glory and the praise that you are worthy of this morning through the services here today, that the body might be encouraged and strengthened, that we might be drawn into closer fellowship with you and with your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Picked up on these verses here just to, uh, to share with you to begin this morning. You know, we uh, talked Wednesday night, considering some of the things that are facing churches today and then we're considering some of the things that are facing uh, even our church particularly and the things that are unfolding in the world around us uh, looking uh, as the pastor to bring things from the word of God that will strengthen the body and encourage the saints and the faith in these last days and so I want to just kind of build on uh, something that I shared Wednesday night that um, I thought was at least worth visiting a little more deeply and particularly this morning. So on Wednesday we we're talking about the fact that materialism, humanism, secularism, all of these have made great inroads into the church of uh, Victory Baptist Church over the years as well as churches across the world uh, today. And so it's just a reality that even ourselves in our own life we have to be really honest with ourselves and say, has my thinking, uh, my allegiance to Christ, have these things been influenced by the world in which I live? And I think it's uh, naive and a little disingenuous to say, I haven't been affected uh, at all by any of the things that are taking place in the world. I think it's obvious that we have been. And so what we talked about was the fact that throughout last year with 2020 and COVID and all the things that have been circulating, we looked at a lot of the statistics, how churches have been impacted, and what we realize is that COVID didn't create these weaknesses within the body of Christ, but rather that it exposed them. And that these uh, weaknesses have been present for a long time. And that now with COVID kind of layered in on top, a lot of people who may have been on kind of shaky ground already or didn't have a good grasp of what the church is really called to be, didn't have a good grasp of what it means to be called to be a saint of God and to be joined together to the church. Uh, the now, because of COVID, a lot of these individuals uh, have abandoned fellowship with the saints. Over half uh, that are being surveyed are saying they really don't want to go back to in-person services ever, uh, that they're content to just kind of cruise along, catch a service or two on a live stream here and there. Uh, and it really misses the entire point of what a church is, the very substance and essence of what a church is called to be. And so we have today a very common thinking that 
Church is an event that happens, right? How many times do we hear about having church, right? We're going to have church. Well, you don't have church. Church is something you're a part of. It's a body. It's, it's the body of Christ. And so it's not a thing that happens like a concert or an event that you just show up and have it. It's something you're a part of. Uh, and so it, when you look at the New Testament idea of what Christ founded the church and ordained it to be and let that shape our understanding rather than carrying with us and along with us our contemporary ideas of kind of the semantics and vernacular we're accustomed to, that's the really so important to us in our time. That many people are just carried along with the vernacular of the day and haven't searched the scriptures to actually understand the view of things that God has and that he calls us to accept for ourselves. Say, so, well, what does all that have to do with this verse? Well, because what we're talking about is this very idea of what it means to be a child of God. What does it mean when we come to the faith, right? And we are born again by the power of God to, to the acknowledging of the truth, the receiving of the word of God and truth, uh, the receiving of the Holy Spirit to seal us. When we talk about the faith, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Because really, in a lot of ways, and this is the comment I made Wednesday that I thought, you know, I think that, that we should spend a little more time there. The journey of a child of God in this life is really a journey of the death of unbelief. That from the moment we first come to know the truth and are born again, that is not the terminal end of all unbelief in our life. That in fact, it's the seed of faith that's sewn into a life that's mostly unbelief, right? I work with a guy, uh, Kim Ray, and Jim will know exactly who I'm talking about. He says things like this. There are certain things you can't know until you know certain things. And it's very true. When it comes to the Christian faith, there's certain things you can't know. They're, you're not even going to understand them day one because you can't know them until there's other things that you know. So when we talk about being born again, the new creature that we are in Christ Jesus, that that new creature is full of faith and hope and love uh, towards God and towards the Lord Jesus Christ. But the old man who is dying and fading away is full of unbelief. And so that what we find is that there is many strongholds, there are many strongholds uh, in our life that are unbelief. And why is this important? It's important for a lot of reasons that we understand the work of God's Spirit in our hearts to continue the work that he began. I was talking to a young man not too long ago, and he made a, a comment, something to the ends of, that, you know, that he's basically uh, established in the faith, uh, has a really good handle on pretty much all of the tenets of faith. Uh, there's a few minor points here and there that he could brush up on, but he's He's pretty well got a good handle on it all. Which in and of itself, that statement uh, exposes the fact that this individual doesn't quite have a grasp of what we're talking about. Because when we believe that I've, I've pretty much already learned it all, pretty much already got it all figured out, it, it really exposes how immature in the faith we actually are. It doesn't paint a portrait of someone who's just extraordinarily seasoned and mature in the faith because there's many things in our life that continue with us as believers that are actually in our life the working product of unbelief if it weren't so we would never sin we would never transgress we would never trespass if we were perfectly persuaded of the truth of God's word in every aspect of our lives, then we would never sin. So the very fact that we can reflect on our own Christian experience and say, I continue to fall short. I continue to transgress. I continue to miss the mark. What does all of that bear witness to? It bears witness to the fact that we have not arrived yet. There is much for us to learn. 
And so I want you to see this in Scripture for yourselves. We're going to journey through the book of John real quickly. If we just turn a few Scriptures to John chapter number 11. In John chapter number 11, over and over again, we see the Lord Jesus Christ teaching and being concerned with the faith of those that he taught. The faith. I am fully persuaded in my own heart and in my own mind that if the people of God can be brought to fully believe more holy more deeply, more intimately, if the faith of God's people is built up, all of the other things that flow from that faith are easy to teach. It's easy to get people to accept the truth of God's standard concerning all the things the Apostle Paul taught about how we dress, how we talk, how we use our tongue, how we use our music to praise his name, uh, how we are uh, involved in the body of Christ. We're not just an ancillary appendage that's like a bracelet the church puts on once a month. No, we're a member of the body. We're part of what's happening. This is our life. It is the essence of who we are as individuals. So all of that stuff gets easy as people mature in the faith. What I think is largely the problem is that in our day, what is often lacking is the faith. Not absent, but at least immature. Because it's not a zero-sum game. For those who come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not perfect, we are being perfected. So what I'm asking God's people to do is to simply acknowledge that there is room to grow. There's room in my life for growth. And it starts with growth in my faith. Because if my faith remains little and small and weak, everything else in my obedience to Christ that flows from a heart of faith remains anemic and malnourished and, and has no strength to actually accomplish the will of God that he has for us in Christ. The Bible does say, does it not, for those who have believed that there are certain things that Christ has ordained for us to walk in. In other words, he determined them for us. So, let's look at a few examples to see if this could be true with us because one of the, one of the temptations for the child of God is to be content and settled in his faith and to begin to tell himself that I'm fine just doing what I'm doing. What I'm doing is great. What I'm doing is enough. What I'm doing is sufficient. What I have learned is all I need to learn. What I am doing is all I need to be doing. Right? And so we have this temptation to be complacent in our walk with Christ. And the walk of complacency is simply not found in Scripture. You find in Scripture the Apostle Paul himself saying that he's striving for some things. This isn't a complacent faith. Uh, the, the journey of faith is not a journey of complacency. It's a journey of striving to apprehend some things, striving to obtain some things, striving to, to reach forward and lay hold of some things. So we see that all through the New Testament. And so as a child of God, when we come to faith, this is the beginning of our growth. I mean, you don't bring a child into the world, right, and just assume that because it's fully formed and developed physically with the necessary members, that it's fully equipped to do all the things it will need to do. What do you do? You train, you educate, you develop, you refine, you work with the individual so that the natural gifts and abilities that they've been given, they can develop. Sounds like a parable about talents, right? The Lord gave talents and 
They were expected to use the talents and grow them so they could give the Lord back more than what they had received. So in John chapter number 11, verse number 14, we have an interesting conversation as the Lord is conversing with his uh, disciples. Right? So this is a conversation the Lord is having with his followers. People who are following him already. And he says in verse number 14, he says unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may, what? Believe. Now, if you're a disciple of Christ, that may strike you as an odd statement for him to make to you. Because you might say, believe, I'm already following you. I'm already a disciple. I'm already a believer. What do, you, what do you mean that you're glad Lazarus died so that I could believe? It doesn't seem to make sense. And if you were, um, you know, a millennial disciple, you'd even get offended. <laughs> Lord, you, how dare you accost my faith and, and insinuate that, that I don't believe? I mean, what are you trying to say? I'm, I'm appalled at the suggestion, right? That, no, he's telling them very plainly, this is deliberate because you still need to believe some things. You have believed some things, but you have yet to believe some things. And that is the journey of faith in our life, the death of unbelief. Because while we have believed, that is not the end of the work he has begun. We are going to continue to learn and believe. So here he's telling his disciples that he's glad he wasn't there to the intent that ye may believe. Turn over two more chapters to John chapter number 13. In John chapter number 13, the Lord is having a conversation with his disciples again. And this is at the end of his ministry. So Christ has been teaching them for a little over three years They've seen the miracles. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him heal the blind. They've seen him restore the cripples. They've seen him uh, do all these things to heal all the diseases and all the miracles. They've seen him uh, do so much. And yet, at this moment in time, he's still interested in their belief or lack thereof. We find in John 13, verse number 18... He says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Right? So what's he preparing them for? For the betrayal of Judas. Right? He's teaching them already, and he had been telling them, one of you will betray me. So he's, he's already telling them that this is going to happen. It's already determined that it's going to happen. And so he's telling them all this, and there's a reason. In verse number 19, he says, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may what? Believe that I am he. So we see in that verse that the Lord is still challenging the disciples to grow in faith. This is after Peter's famous acknowledgement of the fact that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, right? There's a lot of things that have happened in the Lord's time with the disciples, and he's challenging them to grow in their faith. If you turn over just a couple more chapters to John chapter number 16, near the end of this um, same dialogue and discussion as they continue to talk about these things, we read it, uh, verse number 29. After he uh, concludes this part of his talk with them, his disciples said unto him in verse number 29, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we, what's that next word? Sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we what? Believe that thou camest forth from God. Here are this group of men affirming their faith. 
for the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of who he is. And you would think that the Lord would be pleased that they're at least professing and confessing a, a good profession, as Paul might say, right? They're, they've made a good profession. But the Lord, as Lord, is not content for their sakes to leave it at a profession. He challenges their profession, and he uses an interesting way to do it. Notice what he says to them in verse number 31. The Lord answered them four words. Do ye now believe? I mean, this is right before his crucifixion. And here are these men who followed him and professed their faith for him, declared their love for him, and yet the Lord is challenging their own perception of the strength of their faith. And they're saying, we're sure, we believe. What did Paul say? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. So the Lord pushes back against their certainty. And he says, do you now believe? Do you believe? The human heart and mind is so easy to deceive itself. And I think the Lord is doing this for their sakes and for our sakes. Clearly, there's an innumerable com a host of stories and records that John says could be given in Scripture, but these were chosen for a reason. And John even tells us at the end of his gospel why he chose these, and we'll take a look at that perhaps in just a moment. But here, the Lord is challenging them to examine themselves. Hey, it's great that you profess faith. And the Lord doesn't even say they don't have any. But he does question their belief. Do you really believe? Because listen, he's going to go on to explain a very important principle. You can know what you believe by what you do. What you do is always and only motivated by what you believe to be true. It's impossible for it to be otherwise. You will not do something unless you believe something that motivates you to do that. So... Why, why do children not listen to their parents? Because they know their parents don't mean it. They don't believe their children, their parents, when the parents say, you better do this. Ch children that are children of parents who are very inconsistent or have no discipline at all for their children, guess what K kids hear whenever parents say, you better do this, they hear blah, 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 right? Why do children's behaviors not change even though the parents are saying, you better, because the children don't believe them. You will always act on what you believe. Why do children whose parents consistently follow through with their word, by the time that child is coming of years, you can tell the child, you better do this. And what the child going to do? They're going to be motivated by their faith. They've got faith that even though they haven't seen what might follow if they disobey, they believe that mom or dad means what they said. And the behavior is motivated by that faith. In your work, how seriously do you take your boss? How seriously do you take your spouse? I see it all the time in marriages. Husbands and wives who do not value the other. They don't believe they're important. And it shows itself in their own behavior because they act as if they're unimportant, which demonstrates, I don't think you're important, right? So everything you do is a reflection of what is in your heart. Notice what Christ goes on to say. Do you now believe? Behold. What's he telling them to behold? He's like, look, there's something you need to pay attention to. It says, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own. 
If there is a weakness in the church today, it's that every man is scattered to his own. Paul uses this same indictment to say, look, there are very few men who are concerned with the things that are Christ's because every man is concerned with that which is his own. So the Apostle Paul echoes the same sentiment that here we see the Lord Jesus Christ in his indictment of the unbelief of these disciples, the ones who are going to be the foundation of the new covenant, right? The, of the New Testament faith that's preached and taught through the entire world, whose names are engraved in the 12 foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. These men, he's telling them at this moment in their life, do you believe? Because this is what's about to happen. And when it happens, then what, can, what is the end result of that? That there's a self-examination. He says, man, I never thought I would do that. How many of you have ever done something you never thought you would do? All, every person who's honest with themselves, no matter how long you've been saved, you say, I surprise myself sometimes at the things I do. Abhorrent things that if somebody else did them, I'd be questioning their salvation, right? <laughs> They can't, they can't possibly, you know, do something like that. But when it's me, what is it? It is a witness of areas of our life where unbelief still reigns supreme. Unbelief still rears its ugly head. We have not yet acquiesced and yielded to the truth. We're still hanging on to a little bastion of unbelief in our life where the lie reigns. And it shows itself in what we do. He says, Every man will be scattered to his own and shall leave me, next word, alone. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve both. The things Christ has commanded us are not compatible with you seeking your own things. He said, seek me first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. You cannot seek the things of Christ and the other things. We're called to seek the things of Christ and let him add the other things. So he says, because, he says, yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Notice what he says next. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. <laughs> That's interesting, right? So he's continuing to develop them. He knows they're not where they need to be. He knows they're weak in the faith, at least. He's even questioning them to their faces, do you even believe? Do you believe? Ask yourself the real question, do you believe? That's the question the Lord is asking his apostles the very night that he's about to be betrayed as he spent all these years being with them, teaching them, developing them, and helping them to grow. So we see even in the apostles' lives, you get to the end of the Gospel of John in chapter number 20, In verse number 30, oh wait, sorry, John chapter 20, verse number 27 is where I want to look first. This is after the Lord's resurrection. He's begun appearing to his disciples. You might recall he appeared and Thomas was missing. He then shows up again when Thomas is with them in verse number 26. And he announces to them, Peace be unto you. And he says this to Thomas in verse number 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless. Be not faithless. Here he just comes right out and calls him faithless. Now, if you or I were Thomas, 
We might think, Lord, you didn't have to say that in front of everybody. <laughs> For starters, you know, you're supposed to what are you supposed to do? Build up in public and admonish in private or something is a leadership course, as they tell you. Um, the Lord never took that class. So he just calls them out. <laughs> Says, Thomas, you were unbelieving publicly. How about I just acknowledge that publicly? <laughs> and so he tells him, faithless. Wow. And Thomas is thinking, well, Lord, I'm here. I mean, I've stayed around. I'm not completely without any form of belief of some kind. But the Lord doesn't encourage him to be content with a small faith of some kind. He encourages him to believe. And so the journey for the child of God is always one of embracing faith. Embracing faith. You know, we live in a day and age in which people want you to think that reason and faith are, are somehow uh, contradictory one of another. That you can't have faith and embrace reason. That is the construct the world has given us to say that faith is kind of a crutch for people uh, who need it, you know, because it makes them feel better, gives them some peace of mind, gives them some hope, and it may, maybe it's useful in those regards for them, uh, but it's really for those of us who have reason and all these things, we're much more content with reason than faith. There is nothing... I want you to understand this morning, there is nothing about faith in Christ that God has ever asked us to believe that is unreasonable. It is the most reasonable course of action for any man to take. Faith and reason are not uh, enemies. They're, they're good bedfellows. I mean, they're, they work hand in glove. That reason, and what, is we, what have we seen all through God's word that, in fact, the faith is chiefly aimed at our understanding to persuade us to repent, a change of mind, be persuaded of the truth of God's word and to believe with the heart that, that, that we understand the truth of God's word. So the teaching of God's word does aim at the heart, but it also does little good to aim at the heart and appeal to the heart if you don't understand it. So reason and faith are very much hand. Faith is an enemy of credulity. Being credulous means I just believe things with no evidence, no proof. And what the world has done is said that faith is in fact credulous, that there's no proof, there's no evidence, that there's no good reason you can give to embrace faith. So faith is credulous, and that is a lie. Our faith is rooted in history, in science, in fact, and in archaeology, in every regard, God has left himself witness to the faith we profess. It is, it is far from being credulous. It is, in fact, rooted in truth and fact itself. So when we see what uh, the Lord is telling Thomas here, he says, don't be faithless. Be believing. A good question for us as we navigate our lives and move ahead into the unknowns of what the world may have in store, uh, you know, as we move into this next era of new normal and everybody's trying to figure out what does that mean uh, for us as children of God? What does that mean for our church? What is that? Like we said Wednesday, uh, having church is not the point. The church, as we experience it, may not always look like this. The whole point may not be getting together in this building. Uh, and doing the formal things that we're used to being able to do. But that's okay. Those are instruments to help accomplish the purpose and the mission that Christ has given us. Those things in and of themselves are not what is treasured. They're not the point of what we're doing, right? So we can be okay with knowing that if things are, have to change, that can be okay. Some things are just traditionally the way we do things doesn't mean that they're necessarily unchangeable. They can't be altered. Uh, they're not laws from God, for example. So he tells them to be believing. In our own life, as we move ahead, we need to ask ourselves to be believing. When, uh, when the doctors and the scientists and all the people are telling you all of these things are true and factual, 
uh, and are not to be questioned, and maybe some of them are true and factual, but the problem is far too many of them are to be questioned uh, to know that I can trust them just at a brush. I've gotten to the place where I'm trying not to be cynical, um, but I find myself being a, so cynical sometimes. If I pick, it's interesting, I just observed this in my, for myself the other day, that when I pick up this book to study it, that the cynic in me is, is completely silent and at rest. I never, have, I never have studied this book and felt like I needed to do so with any uh, skepticism or uncertainty or, cyn you know. But anytime I pick up uh, anything that a man wrote, I feel like I've always just got a little bit of a cynic that's kind of, even stuff I've written, and I'm reading it again. It's like, mm, yes. But when I read God's word, you know what I do? That, that whole side of me just dies. It just goes away. He, he finally shuts up and leaves me alone. And everything that's in here, I just rest in it and search it out and interested in what God has to say because this is true. Yeah. It's not mingled. with any. Even when men write things about it, which I have attempted to do, which I think is a good thing to try to do to share our faith. But even when we do that, it's still a mingled product. It's the thoughts of men. It's scripture from the word of God. This is completely without mixture. Right? This is just pure truth. And that's just such a wonderful piece to have that you can come into this book and know that and have that confidence. So Paul, uh, the Lord tells um, Thomas here, don't be faithless, but be believing. He goes on in verse number 29, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe. What was the Apostle John concerned with? Faith. Giving men opportunity for faith. And you say he wrote these things down so that you could believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. Now, what's interesting is we have many today, and we talked about this a little bit on Friday night in our Bible study, that we have many today who say that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, because they want to be a partaker of the covenant. But they have cast his words behind their back which is exactly what the Old Testament scriptures uh, are used to teach us is the heart of a wicked man. I want the blessings of the covenant of Christ, but I have no interest in hearing what Christ has to say to me. I'm not interested. But then that really betrays the reality that he is not, in your mind, Christ or Lord. So we have betrayed ourselves in the reality of the fact that we're not interested in what Christ has to say to us. That we feel completely complacent and content to live in unbelief and not to embrace faith as Christ was always compelling his apostles to do. And so we see over and over again through the scriptures that Christ and the apostles are admonishing, encouraging, strengthening the disciples to continue in the faith. Continuing in the faith doesn't mean just only clinging to what I know, but continuing to grow in my faith and die to unbelief. And so we have the apostles writing to the Corinthians saying, we trust that when your faith is increased, then we shall be enlarged by you. This is an expectation of the work of God's spirit in the hearts of his people, that he will not leave us in a place with little faith, but it is in fact just like the seed of a, the mustard seed that's planted and it begins to grow and it begins to take over and to dominate and to manifest itself in very powerful ways that the seed which took root and went down into the earth, which can't be seen, puts out growth that is manifest and visible to everyone and it puts on leaves and all of a sudden there's this big thing that's manifest to the world while all of the roots that are founded in the faith 
are in the heart, in the earth, and can't be seen. But it's impossible to think that that seed could be planted, that it could take root, and that those roots could grow and develop and spread in the heart, and that all that could be going on in the hidden things under the earth, and that there not be a plant, that there not be a trunk, that there not be leaves, that there not be a manifestation of that faith which has taken root in the heart of man. So all through the scriptures, do you want me to calm down a little bit? I'm just saying, it's important to know that the way that Christ presents the faith and the apostles present the faith is that it's impossible for that faith that has taken root to do anything but produce the plant that was in the seed to begin with. It's impossible. It will do it. God is faithful. So we see all these things are written for that purpose that we might believe. And we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through his name. We live in a world that is dominated by unbelief. And just as secularism and humanism and materialism are rooted in unbelief, and they have made huge inroads into churches, and that many churches now see their ministry through the lens of unbelief. They see themselves as agents of society. They see themselves as uh, agents of change for the betterment of mankind. They see themselves as social agencies to meet the needs of people who are hurting and are hungry. And, and all those things are good, but they are of the world. If they're not rooted in faith, they're meaningless. The whole point of the gospel is to deliver men from the things of this world and to bring them to a knowledge of the truth in Jesus Christ and to give them a faith that produces a hope that is of God. And that's what we see all through the scriptures. This world is dominated. We could go through uh, at length talking about how all of the manifestations of unbelief began in the world, right? We had evolution pop up. We had uh, all these things that began to question God's word uh, and whether it could have actually happened that way. And then what began to happen? Theologians began to see what the secular scientists were doing, and they began thinking, we have a problem. And then to solve the problem, we have theological liberalism that looks to blend evolution and science and all these things and somehow contrive a way to make it work with God's word. And in so doing, what have we done? We have been yoked together with unbelievers. And the unbelieving are winning the day. So it seems. They're, they're certainly winning the day as far as this world is concerned. What is the net result of all this? This is what we see happening in churches. And we need to be aware of it in our own thinking so that it doesn't happen in our church. Is that faith has been relegated to a place of moral values. That in large part, religion in America is seen as an instrument of ethics, an instrument of moral values, a place where the family can learn and grow, a place where society can have a foundation uh, that allows it to have community and to develop and to blah, dee, blah, dee, blah, 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 right? It's just all this stuff. But what is the point of preaching if not to bring men to faith? It is not to be relegated to a moral ethical code. And so I think as we see all of this happening in the world, this is what has happened. That Christianity today is seen in the realm of values. In other words, the things that work for me. And Christianity, even by Christians, is no longer seen as a revelation of divine, absolute truth. And I'm not a Christian because I embrace the values. I am a Christian, first and foremost, 
because I've been wholly persuaded that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the revelation to man of what is true. And these things are, are lost on each other today. That many Christians do not understand the Christian faith in the terms of revealed truth. That it is objective, that it is absolute, that it is God's view of what is real and what is right and what is true and what has been and what will be. Many people now see the Christian faith as simply it works for me. I like the values. Uh, I like how it uh, helps support what I'm doing in my life. And, and the, the, the way that this unfolds is deliberate it's dangerous, and if I was like Josh, I would have thought a few other things that start with D. It's, it's a deliberate attack. It's very dangerous. It's detrimental to the faith. It's uh, disassociated the truth from, I don't know, we can keep going with these. But uh, anyway, should have thought of that about a little in advance. First of all, we see what is the, what is the result of this push of, of liberal theological views that seek to elevate man's reason and relegate divine truth of God's word. Well, we see, first of all, that science is treated as all-knowing, and the Bible becomes kind of a fairy tale or a myth that teaches us important values. That is very dominant in the Christian faith today. I'm not talking about the way the world views it. I'm talking about the way people in pulpits teach it. And that is not the Christian faith. The Christian faith is not to stand behind the pulpit and, and to abandon the reality of Christ's miracles so that you can teach an important moral lesson. That is not the faith. He either did the miracles or he did not do the miracles. If he did not do the miracles, then the testimony we have is a lie. And if it's a lie and not of the truth, it's not of God, and it's of no help to us, and we need to go find something else to do. But if it is, in fact, a revelation of divine truth, then we have no choice if we have believed that but to understand what are the implications of a world in which Jesus Christ is literally in truth and in fact Lord of all. What are the implications for me if that's true? Well, they seem to be significant. It seems to hold a lot of weight in the eyes of God Almighty who has given everything to his son that if a man knows this is the objective truth that's, that's much more impactful than if it's just a nice set of ethics that appeal to me and help me do life the way I want to do life I enjoy doing life with ethical people so we're going to do life together uh, because we like we have these values in common it's very common today. So when science becomes all-knowing, the Bible becomes a myth. Then we have Genesis, the creation account, relegated to being poetry or fantasy, which has a general message but shouldn't be taken literally. Mankind's not seen as totally depraved. Um, we have kind of an optimistic view of mankind and an optimistic view of our future. The social gospel is emphasized um, and the inability of fallen man to fulfill the will of God is marginalized. So we're, we're now agents of society, uh, albeit none of us are capable of actually fulfilling that mission very well. Uh, nonetheless, it's, it's kind of chiefly seen as the, the drive and purpose of the church in the world today. Whether a person is saved from his sin and its penalty in hell doesn't seem really to be a relevant issue anymore. Uh, we've graduated past a meaningful definition of salvation. Because if there's no hell, saved from what? What does it even mean? It has no meaning. So the purpose of mission of the church as it relates to evangelism seems to be little concerned today with declaring the truth of God's word so that men might believe and have faith towards God, which is the whole point of preaching. But now the preaching seems to be uh, appreciating more our ability to make the world a better place. The main thing today is how man treats his fellow man. 
Love is the defining issue and, and doctrine of the day. And love is very important, by the way. But let me tell you what's happened in our time. We have taken the verse that says God is love, and we have translated it to mean love is God. And people today are living under the motto, love is God. And that is not what the scriptures say. And it is a corruption of the truth. But men seem to be content serving love and assuming that in doing so, we are pleasing God rather than the other way around. So ultimately, what happens? Man's reason, it becomes the stressing point of what we're trying to focus uh, and man's reason is the final authority. You say, well, I don't believe that. Don't you? Don't you believe that? Don't you believe man's reason is the final authority? You say, well, I don't. No, I don't believe that. Well, because you're in church and the preacher's asking you and you know that's a bad answer. Because even the heart of man who's alienated from God knows that's a bad answer. Even some people might not know that. You say, I don't believe that. Go back to what Christ told his dis disciples in John. Is that not exactly what we believe? Is that not exactly what we embrace in the choices we make? The things we choose for our life? And it can be as simple. I didn't want to get out of bed in time for Sunday school. Then you believe, let me just let me put a real fine point on it. You believe that your authority is higher than Christ's own authority. Right. Simple. That's what we believe. And it's so uncomfortable to get to the place where we will just confess the truth. And cry out with tears, Lord, help my unbelief. I'm not saying you're not born again or you're lost. You could be if you continue to content yourself in your condition because the Holy Spirit will not allow you to stay in that condition. Or he will make your life so miserable that you will just be a miserable, miserable individual to be around and hopefully bring you to the place where you will repent. But a child of God cannot go on thinking that the word of Christ has no authority over me. It's just not reasonable. It betrays our profession. We can say what we want all day long, but as Christ would say, what do you really believe, though? Because you're all about to run off to do your own thing and leave me alone. So what do you believe? When we uh, see what is happening in the world today and that man's reason is exalted, uh, we exalt our way of thinking above Christ's way of thinking. We exalt our view of the world above Christ's view of the world. We exalt uh, our wish list of things we'd like to do above the list of things that Christ says he wants us to do. In all of these areas of life, we continue to see what we believe as men is that our opinion, our view, our priorities, our will is supreme. If we can make room for Christ, we will, but it's going to be on our terms. It's not going to be on the terms he set forth in scripture to say, this is my will. But if I can make a little room, then I will. And I'll do it on my terms. Uh, and then I'll, you know, say something nice on Facebook about Jesus. And it makes it all good. Because, you know, it's, it's good to put Jesus on Facebook. You know, it's, but it would be better to put Jesus in your heart. And to exalt him by giving him your will and saying, Lord, I want your will to be my will. And it's amazing what he will do as we continue to do that. This is the death of unbelief in our life. 
And for a child of God, it is the journey of faith. Because as unbelief dies, faith abounds. When unbelief is on the throne, faith does not abound. So not surprisingly, what are some results of this? We'll kind of conclude for this morning. Once our faith is no longer connected to truth, in other words, we view our faith as a set of ethics and values that help give our life identity uh, and meaning and purpose and teach us to do right, right? That's, how, that's what Jesus means to me. He's a uh, mentor. He's a teacher that you know, shows me good things that I can do um, for other people. That's about all he is, apparently. He's not Lord exactly, but I mean, he's kind of a mentor, uh, maybe a sidekick. You know, he's the good angel on my shoulder that whispers in my ear. Um, whatever he is to you, right? Whatever we have decided he is, once it's no longer about truth. In other words, we don't realize that my faith is rooted in the revelation of God's truth, which is where true faith must lie. That this is what God said and it's the truth. Then that's genuine faith. Once we disconnect those things uh, and we disconnect truth about the world, then we can judge primarily um, the place that faith ought to have in our life by its usefulness. We'll judge our Christianity and our faith uh, and the place it has in my life by how useful it is to me. If it's helpful for me to attend once in a while, I can. If it's helpful to share the gospel once in a while, I might. Uh, I might pray once in a while, right? But we don't think of our faith and our relationship with Christ in terms of the fact that we have received the revelation of divine truth. It's more about my faith is helpful to me in the ways that I choose. Once we begin going down that path, it's very easy for other priorities to easily eclipse our devotion to Christ, which is what happens. Other priorities eclipse our devotion to Christ, such as sports, homework, laundry, dishes, entertaining family, sleeping in, preserving peace with the family, taking care of the goats, looking after the cows and the chickens, tending to the, uh, the stuff at home. My, my wife won't be happy if I make her get up early to come to church. My husband doesn't want to get up and, and be faithful. All of these other priorities begin to eclipse our devotion to Christ because we're not thinking of it clearly. The point of our faith is not that it's helpful to us. The point of our faith is that God has revealed to us the truth and we are called to serve Christ. There, there's a big difference. There's a big difference between seeing faith as something that serves me and understanding faith is the reality of what God has revealed that's true that I'm to serve Christ I don't think these two could be any further apart and yet all of us in our life struggle to grasp that right there's this tension between the spirit and the flesh we're all familiar with that the question is how many victories has the spirit won in your life lately How many victories has the spirit won lately? And how many is the flesh winning lately? Because some of them are, are not hard. <laughs> some of them is simply, am I devoted to Christ in this area of my life? And it, make a decision. Choose to let the devotion that Christ ought to have from you show in your life. Once we... Have, I jotted down a few things here. That's why I'm reading a little more from my notes today. Once we understand that our faith uh, can be easily relegated to a lower priority based on our choosing, uh, depending on how it fulfills or detracts from the purpose we have for it, that's a dangerous path to choose. The purpose of faith is to give Christ the place we know he has been given from the Father not to decide what place to give him based on how useful he is to us. And so, very, very dangerous indeed. We have uh, in Luke 17, 5, just a very familiar verse. I'm going to finish with this. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. 
increase our capacity to believe and yield to the truth you have revealed in your word. That what you said is true, and that when I think of it differently, the only possibility is that I'm wrong. If God has revealed in his word that this is what is true and right, then any other view I hold, no matter how dearly I hold it, is the wrong view. It's an ungodly view. It's an unbelieving view. So what are we to do? Well, we are to confess, to repent, and to ask the Lord to increase our faith. If we are a believer this morning, it can only be because we have acknowledged the gospel to be true. Christianity can be helpful to you. It can alter and affect your behavior and your attitudes. But ultimately, if we're a child of God, it's not for those reasons. It's chiefly for the reason that we have understood the revelation of the gospel to be true. In light of that fact, all of us ought to be praying to the Lord, increase our faith. You're going to need it in the days ahead. The world is not going to become friendlier to people of faith. It is not going to get easier to meet together. It is not going to get easier to serve Christ. Don't expect it. If you read your Bible the way I do, evil men are going to wax worse and worse to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So don't expect the politicians to save you from the deteriorating effects of this world. It won't get easier, and what we need is not for it to be easy. What we need is more faith. Lord, increase our faith.